All right, good day, everybody. It's a nice day on this April 13th here, and hopefully it's just as good where you are. Uh, with me here today is Dr. Mark Levitan, who is the lead engineering researcher at the National In uh, Windstorm Impact Reduction Program at the National Institutes for Standards and Technology. And uh, Mark, I guess today you're going to be talking about the development of the tornado hazard uh, maps and load provisions for the ASE 7-22 uh, uh, building load standard. Uh, hopefully I get that right. Um, and uh, over the next hour, you'll be talking and then we'll have a Q&A session uh, after that. Now, if anybody, if you're interested in, in asking a question or uh, a comment, there are two ways of doing it. One is you could actually go and use the raise your, raise your hand option, which should show up on your go to webinar control panel. And the other one is you can submit a question in the question the panel there in the in the same control panel. Either way, uh, I'll be monitoring that, and then we'll wait for the Q and A at the end of this webinar. Mark, you have the floor. Great, thanks, Jim, and appreciate the invitation to uh, uh, present this material. So this is sort of a uh, follow-on, kind of a part two from from last week's webinar. Um, that on development of the, the tornado maps themselves. And so we'll see uh, just a few slides here uh, today on how those maps are integrated into the much bigger picture of the development of uh, tornado loads. What are the implications for that? Uh, I know we have uh, some folks that are not just uh, on the committee. We also have some, some uh, other folks from NWS and some other guests. So I'll provide a, a little bit of background uh, to, to, to start us off and then go through um, uh, the development of some of the provisions and then go through some of the actual provisions. And then what are the implications uh, in terms of uh, loads and even a little bit of cost? We have a little bit of a, a case study uh, that, that we'll look at in terms of what, what, what changes is this going to mean for, for engineering, engineering practice. So with that, let me go ahead and uh, turn off the video here so you have the full slides and um, move on. I also just like to um, acknowledge the uh, significant contributions this uh, of, of, of a large number of collaborators. I'll point out some of them along uh, specifically along the way, uh, but they're, they're, they're this uh, what I'm presenting here is the result of uh, six years of effort by a very large number of people. And for those who aren't from the engineering world, uh, you know we don't design buildings for tornadoes right now, with the exception of nuclear facilities, with the exception of tornado shelters. Uh, and some very rare other buildings, occasionally an emergency operations center or something like that. We don't design buildings for tornadoes and the word tornado doesn't appear in the building code with the exception of tornado shelter. Uh, and so why is that? Why, why, don't we, why don't we consider that? Um, so I think there's a, a series of kind of common misperceptions that we're dealing with related to tornadoes in the engineering and the built environment world uh, that they're too rare uh, that the losses from tornadoes are small compared to other hazards, that there's nothing we can do about them. Uh, some people think we just don't, don't know enough, uh, that we don't have in, inadequate knowledge. Gosh, if we designed for tornadoes, we'd all have to be, live in concrete bunkers or we'd all have to live underground. Uh, it'd be too expensive. There's nothing we can do. And so I think these, these misperceptions have kind of led to just some inaction and just kind of, kind of shrug our shoulders and say, hey, okay, well, I guess we're just going to have to live with that. But I think, I think a lot of these perceptions may, may be shaped by the few violent tornadoes per year that really make kind of the national headlines. And otherwise, if you're not hit by a tornado or if you're not really in, 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 uh, in Norman, Oklahoma or some other place where that's all day, every day on the news, uh, you know, in, in the spring is, is what's going on with, with tornadoes. They're just sort of out of sight, out of mind, and you just don't, don't, don't really think about that. So, um, and of course, a lot of this audience is gonna know this, but maybe not everybody. So how rare are tornadoes really? Well, there's over 1200 tornadoes reported per year in the US. Last time we talked about um, that there, the number of reported tornadoes is not the same as the number of tornadoes, right? Uh, we, we know we talked about uh, uh, population bias and some other issues as well, uh, but we have a significant number of tornadoes and there's more that are not reported. Uh, where do tornadoes occur? Uh, well, they, they, we have had tornadoes in all 50 states. Uh, in, in our lower 48, uh, tornadoes primarily occur uh, east of the Rockies, and we talked about that last time as well, and certainly the most intense ones occur there. Uh, here's a slide just of uh, Oklahoma City area showing the tracks of at least of the reported tornadoes over the last 100 and change years, and 
doesn't look that rare to me, right? <laughs> uh, hopefully to you as well. The tor tornadoes uh, seem to occur pretty pretty regularly there over over the time. You say, well, gosh, that's over 120 years. Well, what's the lifetime of a building, right? A lot of times the useful lifetime might be assumed to be 50 years, but hey, plenty of houses more than 50 years. We don't tear them down to start over. So buildings oftentimes live or are, are there for 50 or 100 years or, or more. And so that kind of a time frame is a reasonable time frame to be considering uh, for, for tornadoes. Well, how, how many lives are lost in tornadoes? Um, well, it turns out uh, back when we did some work, and I'll talk to you just briefly about the the the, the Joplin tornado. Um, that at that point, through, 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 we did the study in 2011 that tornadoes kill more people than hurricanes and earthquakes combined on average. And uh, through through 1950 through um, through 2011, we had over 5,600 people that were, were killed by tornadoes, uh, including uh, seven children that were killed in the hallway of the school right here in Moore, Oklahoma in 2013. In, they were in their designated safe area and uh, that was not designed as a tornado shelter, but that was what the school had designated as a tornado safe area. Okay. So we do have ability to design and protect against kind of uh, pretty much mother nature's worst. And if we're gonna design again for, for that, we would either build a FEMA safe room, which are uh, designed to provide near absolute life safety protection. That's exactly explicitly uh, the, the, their, their design intent. ICC 500, the International Code Council has a, a formal standard for design and construction of storm shelters. Uh, they don't use the term near absolute, but they basically provide almost identical requirements to that. And so if you're in the most tornado prone region in, in, in the center of the country, uh, you would design your shelter to withstand 250 mile per hour winds. You'd have debris impacts of a 15 pound two by four traveling at 100 miles per hour. So not the absolute worst theoretically possible, but um, we're right up there at the top of the scale. Uh, I'll also note that there has been no reported failures of any storm shelters or safe rooms that have been constructed to e either of these guidelines, uh, even though there's been a large number at this point that have been hit and have saved a lot of lives. There's many, many thousands of storm shelters and safe rooms. So we can and do know how to build to protect against um, a significant tor tor tornado events. But that's not, uh, and, and we have that, that, that existing technology, but what about for, uh, for the rest? Okay, so how much damage um, do tornadoes, do tornadoes cause? So we design our buildings and infrastructure for hurricanes, for thunderstorms, for flooding, for snowstorms, earthquakes. We have a whole list of other hazards, but we don't design buildings for tornadoes. So, uh, so how much damage do tornadoes cause? Well, over the 20 year period from 97 through 2016, tornadic events and, and sort of tornadic storms caused 40% of the catastrophic insured losses in this country, according to Insurance Information Institute, Hurricanes and tropical storms only cause 38%. So let that sink in for a minute. Okay, granted, we only have a couple of uh, hurricanes and tropical storms, typically uh, landfalling per year total, uh, and obviously they're much bigger, but on an average annual basis, over a long period here, tornadic storms cause more damage uh, and, and more insured losses than hurricanes. So gosh, gosh, that doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe we should be designing for tornadoes, huh? So other perception here maybe is, isn't the damage caused by the biggest tornadoes? Well, it turns out that, that property damage resulting for, for the individual, for each individual tornado, an EF0 or EF1 just causes very little damage on a relative scale on average. Uh, and EF5s cause a huge amount. So if we look at the black line here on the bottom, this is total losses uh, in, in millions of dollars on this axis. Note that this is a log scale, please. So uh, 10 to the zero. So this would be this line right here. If you can see my mouse would be uh, would be one million dollars um, uh, right, right here. But so this is the, the black line is the average loss per say for, for right here for an EF1, the average loss per EF1 tornado. But the red line, if we say, hey, well, there's a lot more EF1 tornadoes than there is EF5 tornadoes. So if we take the aggregate losses, and this is some work that Frank Lombardo did uh, when he was at NIST on, on our Joplin investigation, looking at the statistics, the average loss per tornado in intensity category is a pretty flat, except for the for the zeros, uh, which the wind speeds are really low enough that they don't, don't cause some, so very much damage. That on average, so if we can protect even from ones and twos or the lower categories, we can take a significant bite out of all the total uh, damage. 
So we have this opportunity for tornado loss reduction that we don't have to design everything to withstand the most violent tornadoes like we do with our, our, our storm shelters. Um, if we look at the statistics of the um, tornado intensity, we see on the, on the right here, the blue bar represents the EF0, so that's about 60 some odd percent uh, of all tornadoes. EF1s is another 20 some odd percent, et cetera. So the, the more intense tornadoes are a very small percentage. So from uh, 1995 through 2016, 89% of all the reported tornadoes were EF0 through one. We also talked about last, uh, last week, uh, there is underreporting in those tornado intensities as well. And Josh Werman just wrote a, and Karen Kosib and others just wrote a great paper on that uh, from, from their radar climatology, lots of different analyses. But, so this, but at least that's what we have in terms of the database. So this has shifted a little bit higher. Uh, but still, it's still an overwhelming majority is at these lower. And if we go up through all the way through EF2, we get up to, say, 97%. Not only to mention that is even if you have an EF5 tornado, only a small percentage of the total amount of the area, the wind swept by the EF5 tornado is actually EF5 winds, right? In the Joplin tornado, for example, only 28% of the, the whole tornado uh, uh, land area uh, was EF3 through 5. 72% of that was EF0 uh, through EF2 winds. So if we can do something about the lower category winds, uh, we can get a long ways towards improving our, our, our tornado protection. So what we really need is this paradigm shift here. Uh, thinking about, you know, we understand that the strike probability for a violent EF4 or 5 tornado on any individual building is low, but the strike probability for a less intense tornado uh, is it much greater at the return period similar to those used uh, for other wind hazards, uh, and particularly when we're talking about the areas east of the Rocky Mountains in, in the U.S. And so Really, we, we get, coming to the point now where engineers, architects, building owners, operators, government, society is starting to understand uh, you know, that ignoring tornado hazards and design of our built environment really is not an appropriate response. And so the genesis for this work that I'm showing, and I've, I've kind of mentioned a, a few bits and pieces of it here today, was this technical investigation of the Joplin tornado conducted at NIST uh, under our National Construction Safety Team Authority. That's uh, NCST is like uh, National Transportation Safety Board. You've heard of that after a plane crash or a train derailment, they go out and investigate. After a World Trade Center disaster, uh, it was clear that there was no uh, government agency that had authority to do uh, building investigations. And so Congress uh, gave that authority uh, subsequently to, to, to NIST. And so we did a major multi-year invest technical investigation. Uh, it was the first study really to 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 look at uh, storm characteristics, building performance, emergency communications, human behavior, and the assessment of and the impact of each of those on fatalities and what happened with the damage. And so we had a series of 16 recommendations, uh, including a set of recommendations for improving tornado hazard characterization, for design and construction of buildings, and for emergency communications. Um, the most relevant ones to kind of what we're talking about here today is recommendation three, develop new tornado hazard maps, considering spatial estimates of the tornado hazard. And we talked about that a lot last time. Uh, in, 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 and we talked about the spatial characterization of the new tornado maps. So today I'm gonna focus on recommendations five and six, development of performance based uh, 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 tornado resistant design standards and design methodologies. Just uh, maybe uh, there's probably some folks on that weren't on last time. I just have two or three slides to, to briefly talk about the maps. Uh, Jim had uh, put together and I think he sent out a, um, a webinar recording for uh, the other ones if you're more interested in those map topics. But we had gone through, we had reviewed the existing maps, some challenges with the existing tornado hazard maps when we started this implementation work in 2014. Those maps had no consideration of tornado reporting limitations, population bias, all of the the, the, the challenges within the early years of the database. We didn't have spotter networks or radars and there's many less tornadoes are in the database, all those sorts of things. We had no treatment of the, the target size. Uh, and what we'll see in the, in the maps that we look at here today, the target size has a significant effect. They used judgment-based wind speeds from, from the, 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 the F and the EF scales uh, instead of engineering-based wind speeds. They had a narrow range of return periods. They didn't consider uncertainties. Um, and so that, that kind of provided the support for where we needed to develop those maps. We went through um, and talked extensively uh, uh, about this slide and about lots of these, uh, these different elements, We're looking at all the work we had to do, looking at tornado data and the population bias under other fields, the tornado wind field work, tornado wind speeds and the, the wind modeling uh, to, to estimate what, what it really means if, you had, if, if the database says it was an EF2. Uh, 
did uh, analyzed epistemic uncertainties or the modeling uncertainties, in addition to, of course, the, the, the randomness or the aleatory uncertainties, combined those into risk models to generate hazard maps. This was a six-year effort, um, NIST working with uh, uh, Applied Research Associates uh, and Dr. Larry Twisdale uh, who developed those maps. And um, partway through the project, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, provided some supplemental funding to incorporate the epistemic uncertainty tasks. And so last slide here, uh, just to show, these were some of the example uh, maps and what they look like. So we had a whole different range. If we look on the right-hand side here, we produced maps for lots of different target sizes from uh, point targets all the way up to 4 million square feet. We produced maps for ranging from return periods from as little as 300 years up to 10 million years. Um, and then here's, so actually, <coughs> pardon me, over 50 maps in, in total. Uh, not it, it's not eight times eight is 64 because at the low return periods uh, only the only the, the very largest target sizes were, were relevant. There was no mean mean tornado risk at the at the at the at the very lowest return periods for for these these couple of 300 and 700 year. And so here we have some examples of what these maps look like. These are peak three second peak gust estimated three second peak gust speeds uh, in miles per hour at uh, 10 meters uh, above the ground. Um, and so with that as the background, then the main focus for our work today then is to talk about the tornado load design methodology and how that gets implemented into the ASCE uh, standards. So this is our recommendations five and six. Uh, so we've built that uh, on the wind load framework, which is in the ASCE 716 standard. Uh, and so we've adapted. It turns out most of the different parameters are a little bit different, or most of the parameters are different for tornadoes. And we'll go through in, 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 in some detail today and de describe those. Uh, we work closely with this committee, with, uh, with the radar group from this committee. Uh, uh, Josh and Karen and uh, uh, Jim was, and Don and others uh, to uh, look at what data was available. Uh, radar data, uh, Frank led the effort. We had Mariam was on the looking at this. We looked at numerical studies. We looked at w uh, tornado wind, wind tunnel studies. D did a lot of different analysis to develop a tornado velocity profile. Uh, and then use that because that's going to be an important feature that we need in our engineering design. I will say that uh, uh, Frank and, and Josh and, and, and myself and a few others are going to be presenting in much more detail at a meeting uh, later this spring on uh, development and the analysis behind the development of the uh, uh, velocity profile. Um, uh, we also uh, develop new and modified wind load factors to account for the directionality, to account for internal pressure, and something new that is atmospheric pressure change. For other storms, we don't have to account for that, but we do need to account for that in, in, in tornadoes. And then we also had to come up with a, a coefficient to account for the vertical wind component. And so for the uh, vertical wind component, so if you're near the core where you have the strong updrafts, the, all the pressure coefficients that we've developed, and for uh, those of you from outside, a pressure coefficient, if you don't know that, Maybe think about uh, think about race cars or airplanes. You might hear about drag coefficient, right? Well, the drag coefficient is integrated over the, the whole body, but a pressure coefficient would be a normalized uh, version of what the pressure is at any point on the surface. And that's what we typically get out of wind tunnel tests to be able to understand and what, what underlies all the values in the, in the codes to say, what is the effect of the shape on what the pressures are? And we know we have suction or uplift on the roof and we have uh, inward acting pressures on the windward wall and we have out suction pressures on the side wall and the leeward wall. and so. What we did is in the top right here, this is what, if the wind direction say is blowing left to right, that's what a normal, this is a, a side view of the model. We can't really see it in the depth of what the, uh, what the model, a, a low rise building model would look like. But then to account for this relative change in angle to between the, 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 uh, the, the wind and the roof is basically we uh, tipped the, the, the model into the floor of the tunnel. Now that created some foreshortening of, of, of the windward wall, which wasn't perfect, but that was just a way to be able to get this different relative angle of attack for, for the roof, because the tunnel, of course, in, in the traditional boundary layer tunnel, the wind just blows down the tunnel and you can't change that. Uh, we also did some tests in, a spe in, in, in the w w uh, University of Western Ontario in their Windy Dome Tornado Simulator, but not enough to be able to um, use them systematically. And the, the, the testing for the tornado simulator testing is still in its very early stages and not fu fully accepted. So what we did is we used this Measure the pressures on 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 the uh, on the roof of the building. Well, then we'd use that to develop a modifier 
that was applicable to the existing pressure coefficients. So we can use all of the work that's in the code that has the regular pressure coefficients, and we added this new KV term, which is a non-dimensional modifier to account for, based on some geometry and stuff, to, to account for these differences in uh, the, uh, on the on the uplift on the roof due to the uh, uh, the updrafts. Now we also have th this this modifier, this adjustment factor, is modified to account for the fact that on those wind speed maps that we showed, just be, you're not always inside the core, right? Sometimes you're inside the core, sometimes you're outside the core. If you're out, if you're well outside the core, you don't have the significant vertical velocity of the component. So for, when we took all this wind tunnel data, we, we developed this modifier factor, then we had a, a reduction factor based on uh, some of the analysis, depends upon on average where you are in the country, et cetera, what your wind speed is, uh, the, 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 what, what percentage of fraction you are outside the core. At the higher wind speeds, you're much more likely that you're inside the core, right? When you have these lower wind speeds, like we talked about, maybe you're in the, the Joplin tornado and you're half a mile away from the, the center of the track, you still have 70 or 80 miles per hour uh, wind speed perhaps, but you're nowhere near the core, so you don't have uplift. And so we've, the, the, this KV factor is, is modified to account on average for uh, where you are in, in the position relative, relative to the core and if you have this uplift or not. Uh, and so our ultimate goal here is, as I mentioned, we don't design uh, our, our, our wind load design standards and our building codes don't have tornadoes in them. They don't have tornado loads. So our ultimate goal is to get loads from tornadoes into this ASE 7 document I've showed here. ASE 716 was published in 2016. So that's the current version, the 2022 edition, which is coming out uh, next year, actually in, in 21. They'll publish it in December of this year, uh, but they call it on the 22 cycle. So that's our, our goal to get tornado loads into the, this document, along with all the other loads that are here designed. For, they have earthquake loads. They have regular wind loads for other storms, including hurricanes and, uh, and other wind storms. Uh, we have snow loads, ice loads, rain loads, flood loads, all of our other kinds of loads. So now I'm going to switch hats a little bit. So I was kind of showing you some of the, the, the NIST work. And, and also, uh, I, I also chaired the Tornado Task Committee of ASE 722. And so the ASE task committee took a lot of the R&D that was done and then worked to develop that into uh, provisions for how are we going to uh, uh, actually write this up in the standard. And by the way, this ASCE 7 standard that I'm just showing you, this is the basis. This standard gets adopted into the build, what we call the model building code, which is to, nowadays since 2000, the, the model building code is either be the international building code uh, series or international uh, residential code or our model codes. Now, those are all still just reference documents until a community, whether it's a city, a county, or a state, until a community, and it's different in different parts of the country, they have different rules about who, who governs this, until a city, county, or a state formally adopts the international, hey, we're going to adopt the 2015 edition of the International Building Code, then that becomes law, right, when they, when they formally adopt that or through, through, an, through an ordinance. So this, uh, uh, this document is a reference document. Once this gets adopted into the building code, and then the building code gets adopted locally, then that becomes then that has the force of law. Okay, so um, to how does it work out that the loads are are placed in in ASE seven? So we have this great. We have a brand new chapter number thirty two on tornado loads. Uh, we have an appendix for thirty two, and it turns out that uh, at the lower return periods that we need to design for. Uh, th th that we talked about here, uh, th that we have some requirements that are in the main body of the chapter. We have an appendix that actually has the, these longer return period maps that, that can be used for the nuclear industry. If they want to use them, it can be used for performance based design. It can be used if you want to design for a more intense tornado than the minimum one required by the reliability in, uh, dictated by the, by the standard. And we'll talk more about that later. So the main things here are new, are this new chapter 32. But we also had to change, make some changes to other chapters. Chapter one has our general provisions. So we had to add tornadoes to the risk categorization table, uh, shown it right here and a few others. Chapter two has our load combinations. So we had to add tornadoes into our load combinations. And chapter 26 is our regular wind loads. And we had to put the requirements in in the pointer to get from uh, chapter 26 over to chapter 32. So I'll hit the highlights of some of these uh, introductory chapters and then, get, then we'll get into the meat of the chapter 32. So one of the important things you're gonna see this mentioned a few times in the, in the presentation today is risk category. Uh, and of course our engineers on the audience well know this, the risk category in ASCE 7 
uh, is kind of a measure of the, the, the risk that the building presents to, to human life. And so we have a risk category one would be a building that represents a, a low risk to human life in the event of failure. This is typically going to be maybe some uh, unoccupied buildings that are not occupied all the time, maybe like agricultural buildings or st small storage buildings, things like that, where there isn't people in them all the time. Uh, uh, build, risk category three, uh, buildings which represent the failure, uh, f the failure of which could represent a substantial risk to human life. This is going to be things like schools and assembly centers and theaters, stadiums, those sorts of things where we have a lot of people together in one place. Risk category four is what we call buildings and other structures designated as essential facilities, and I'll explain that here on the next slide. Um, and buildings required, uh, uh, buildings and other structures that represent uh, the failure of which pose a substantial hazard to the community. So what if you have a, a, a refinery or a hazardous waste facility or something where if that failed, uh, a lab where they're studying Ebola or something like that, if they have some failure and then something gets out, whatever, that could be problematic, as well as buildings and structures required to maintain the functionality. So think about this might be, I've got my hospital building, which is going to be a risk category four, this essential facility, but I have to have my physical plant, which is on the same property. The hospital can't run without the physical plant, so we need that. Now, you notice I skipped over risk category two. That's because risk category two is defined as all buildings and structures except those listed in risk categories one, three, and four. And that's what we do a lot in codes and standards is we somehow, if you have four different things and they're completely defined, or did you know, did you ever capture anything? Well, no, you have, you have maybe you have three that are full, completely defined and anything else is your catch-all. So that's what we have here. So basically this risk category two is most of your building. That's going to be homes. It's going to be, you know, small, small apartment buildings. It's going to be small shopping centers and shops and that kind of stuff. So that, that, that's you know a, a lot of your a lot of regular buildings from there. But typically your your municipal buildings, your public buildings, your larger commercial buildings and stuff. A lot of those are going to be these risk category three and four. And these these requirements you'll you'll see why these are going to apply to risk category three and four for tornadoes. As we go through here, uh, in a lot of places I've highlighted in red. A red text, where are the differences from ASCE 7? So this table that I'm showing here is table 151 in the in the standard. We've just added the word tornado to let people know that tornado, that, that this risk categorization also applies to tornado. Uh, not all the loads in the standard use this table for, for a tsunami example uses a different a risk categorization scheme. So essential facilities, those are defined as buildings and other structures that are intended to remain operational in the event of extreme environmental loading from flood, wind. We've added tornado to this list of hazards, snow and earthquake. Um, so that, that and, and make a note here for essential facilities, we have some enhanced tornado requirements for essential facilities uh, and buildings and other structures required to maintain the functionality of essential facilities. Throughout the presentation where we have, where we're talking about the unique requirements for essential facilities, I've highlighted those in yellow. Um, so. Now we talk about load combinations. And so the, the basic five equations that we have here, uh, W in these is wind. And I apologize for, for those uh, not from an engineering background. I, I didn't have all these other symbols on here. W is our, our wind load. WT is a new symbol we added for tornado load. Unfortunately, T, capital T was already taken. That's for, was for thermal loads. Um, but do we, we have D is dead load, L is live load, which is the weight of people and furniture and stuff that moves around in the building. Uh, we have a term L, R, S, or S, or R. That's roof live load, which could be um, uh, people on the roof if it's an occupiable roof, or it could be, hey, you're going to have maintenance, and here's a bundle of uh, uh, here's a bundle of uh, 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 roof shingles up there, or uh, other kind of stuff. Or we can have snow load on the roof, or we can have rain load on the roof. And so what we do in these combinations, the idea behind these combinations is you maximize one of these loads, and the other loads are what they call at their arbitrary point in time. So combination one. Well, what's our kind of our worst case for dead load? What's the combination two? What's our worst case? Dead load is the weight of the concrete and the the the, the steel and the, the 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 carpet and and the ceiling tiles and all the stuff that's permanently affixed to the to, to the building. Um, and so for each one of these equations, we said so we we maximize one of these. And so the two that we're worried about here uh, are the two that maximize equation four maximizes the wind load when it has effects that are coincident with gravity. So uh, uh, we have a dead, and we have instead of having just wind, we have, and these are our load factors. We have wind or tornado, tornadic wind load, and we take the maximum of those and combine that with the other ones. Combination five is for our uplift. So we have 0.9 dead. So we, well, what if our dead load was a little bit less than we thought? 
and and so we have a little bit less gravity to load to resist the the thing and then we have our our either wind or tornado load so a couple important things to note here tornado loads are completely separate they're not treated as a subset of wind they're treated as completely separate load from wind and that's why we're going to look at them also because there's some exceptions here and there's some other places where the combinations aren't exactly the same for example uh we'll combine you know uh, uh, flood loads um uh, uh, typically aren't occurring. The, the flood load combinations or you have a, a strong combination, say, on the coast. When you have a hurricane, we want to design for wind and flood at the same time. Uh, we're not designing for wind and flood at the same time uh, in, in tornado loads. doesn't mean the building doesn't have to get designed for some level of flood. That's handled in the regular combinations. But when we do the tornado, tornadic wind loads, we're not doing flood load combinations. Similarly, uh, the, um, the uh, combination with, where we also have snow on the roof, we don't have to consider snow on the roof because tornadoes are typically warm weather phenomena uh, and, and farther south. So we would, if, if we had any snow on the roof, it would be very minor, nowhere near a, a very significant load. So anyway, there's a few differences here. And so that's why we, we, tra we treat tornadic loads completely separate from, from, from wind loads in our load combinations. Uh, at chapter 26, our general wind load requirement, basically what we did, we added in the very first paragraph, our very first section procedures, that says you have to design your building for wind load. We have a new, a new paragraph shown here in red for risk category three and four buildings and structures, including the MWFRS, that's the main wind force resisting system. So for our, our non-engineers, that's kind of your, your, your steel frame or your concrete frame, your wood frame, that's the main structural frame of the building. CNC is components and cladding. That's gonna be, uh, say, your roof deck and your roof coverings and windows and doors, those kind of, those kind of the smaller elements. So all of those need to be designed to resist because the tornado loads determined in accordance with chapter 32. Uh, and then we uh, deleted, we used to have a limitation that said tornadoes are not considered, and we obviously deleted that. So our chapter 32, that's organized. We paralleled the, the organization of chapter 26. So all the section numbers uh, are, are the same. So if chapter 26, section 11 was gust effects. Uh, in chapter 32, it's now tornado gust effects. Our terminology, our symbology, G, our gust effect factor became G sub T, a gust, it became tornado gust effect factor. So we tried to keep things kind of as parallel as possible because we are building on the same basic framework. But like I said, the GT is a little bit different from G. Uh, we added a new parameter. I told you this KVT that we added for uh, effects, but mostly by and large, it's not gonna look that, that crazy different to you when we get into the equations. So what, um, what do these provisions look like? Let me step through and highlight some of the key aspects of the tornado load provisions. So here's our scope. We already said it applies to risk category three or four buildings. So this is gonna be our critical and essential facilities, our schools, our hospitals, our fire stations, our assembly centers, arenas, uh, you know, uh, even you know, it can be even large, large uh, shopping facilities like where, where people are all in one space, um, you know, the, the, the bigger buildings. Uh, that are in the tornado prone region and here's the tornado prone region basically this area uh, pretty much east of the uh, uh, east of the continental divide there so we have to design the main wind forest and resistant components and cladding shall be designed and constructed to resist the greater of the tornado loads from this chapter or the wind loads from the earlier chapters 26 using the load combinations in chapter 2 that i just showed you now we have a, an user note, and this is very important that we had a bunch of stuff in the commentary. And when we when we balloted this through the through the committee, there were there was some significant concern that people were going to have the impression that, oh wow, we have tornado loads in the standard. So we don't we, we don't have to need tornado shelters anymore. My building was designed to the latest standard, so it's covered for tornadoes. And so what we uh did to, to address those, instead of having it buried in the commentary, we added a user note right on the first page that clarifies, and I'm gonna go through a few highlights, it's a little bit long here, but I'm gonna highlight a few bits and pieces of this. The tornado loads in this chapter provide reasonable consistency with the reliability delivered by the existing criteria and chat wind criteria in chapters 26 through 20 and, 20 and 27, and therefore are only required for risk category three and four. And then we, we point you to the part of the commentary that explains more about why are we only doing risk category three and four? Does that mean houses aren't important? No. But there's other solutions for houses. They don't fit within the current reliability requirements for ASE 7. Tornadoes are too rare for those to, to, to come up with any load that would be greater than the regular wind load. But for the, for, for the risk category three and four buildings, they're not. The tornado loads are based on tornado speeds using the 1,700 and 3,000 year return periods for risk category three and four, respectively. Those, by the way, are the same return periods that we use for the basic wind speeds 
for, uh, for our other wind hazards, for our, our hurricanes and thunderstorms, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'll mention, we. it's not necessarily sure that they would have come out the same, and it just worked out that so it worked out that they came out reasonably close, so we're able to use the same return periods. The key is the, the same reliability of the overall load provisions, not the hazards. But it it, it is work it, it did work out nicely and conveniently that, that uh, they came out about the same. The next item I want to point out here: the tornado speed that we're going to be designing for at any given, ge given geographic location uh, ranges on uh, is going to be approximately an EF0 through EF2. And that's going to depend on the risk category and what we call the effective plan area of the building. Uh, as I mentioned before, and we'll see more later, the target size, how big this building is, affects what the what the wind speed is going to be at a particular return period. And then we point you to the section of the commentary that explains that. Now, importantly, options for protection from life and property from more intense tornadoes include construction of a storm shelter and or design for longer tornado uh, 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 return periods as provided in the appendix, which include what we call performance-based design. And the last part of this user note says, a building or other structure designed according to these tornado loads cannot be designated a tornado shelter without meeting additional requirements from the ICC 500 standard, which is shown here. And we provide, a, I think, probably two pages in the commentary with a very in-depth discussion. We just want to make sure nobody thinks, oh, because tornadoes are in the standard now that we're covering uh, 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 we're covering all the be all and end all of, of, of tornadoes. Uh, and they shouldn't think that. We don't design for the worst possible hurricane everywhere. Yeah, our design speeds in Florida are going to be reflective of a Category 5. Could we get a Category 5 hurricane in New England? It's possible, but not on the a low enough return period that we would do it. So our, our hurricane speeds that we use in New England are less. Uh, so it isn't the worst theoretical possible uh, uh, storm that we could do. So we don't design for the worst theoretical possible hazard. And but some th there was concern that some people might think that tornadoes is different. So that's why we have this very extensive user note in the in the front of the uh, front of the chapter. So let's talk just a bit more about this uh, reliability and analysis and the return periods. This was a we created a, a, an ad hoc working group to study this issue. Uh, it's a collaboration between NIST, ASE7 load combination subcommittee and the ASC 7 wind load subcommittee. Uh, this committee adapted the reliability analysis that was used in ASC 16 for the wind map return periods uh, and used that with the tornado load provisions. So uh, shout out to, to, to Bruce Ellingwood, uh, kind of the guru who developed a lot of this reliability work uh, uh, 40 years ago, back when he was at NIST, uh, uh, back when he was at NIST, when it was called National Bureau of Standards uh, at, uh, at Colorado State now. We conducted a series of risk-informed analyses that show that the proposed tornadic criteria provide reasonable consistency with the reliability of the existing wind loads. So our key findings is the 1,700 and 3,000 years, uh, respectively, uh, provide this reasonable consistency with what we currently have right now. Also, there is no significant tornado risk at the 700-year mean recurrence interval. You just are unlikely to, uh, uh, for 700 years and less, you're just unlikely to to get hit by any get hit by a tornado. And so what happens is here when we look at the four different risk categories, then in chapter 26 for our regular wind loads, we have 300 through 3,000 years is our four different return periods. In chapter 32, it's just uh, not applicable. So in this, this this regard, tornadoes are different than our regular wind speeds, right? We can have you know, we, you know, we, there's some wind on a daily basis. Even if it's calm, there's going to be wind of a few miles per hour. We're not going to get a wind, a tornadic wind, uh, at any time. So even on a, a on a few hundred year basis, you're unlikely to have a tornadic wind speed at any point. It'll just be zero, right? You're just on, it's very unlikely until you get to the longer return periods. It's just on, so that's why we have not applicable for these lowest lowest return periods. Then, okay, so. We already have a few conditions, but there is a few more outs that you can get of whether or not you have to design for tornadoes. Our first flow chart here is the building risk category three or four. Um, and if you're if you're not risk category three or four, you can stop right there. You don't have to do anything more. Uh, you always could do. You could, you know again the, co the the standard and when this gets adopted into the code, the, that's minimum. The, 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 if you remember the word minimum was in the title. And by the way, if you build something to the code. That means you've built the crappiest possible building you are legally allowed to build, right? Minimum means that you can't do any less than that. It doesn't always mean it's the appropriate solution for your particular needs. It doesn't mean it's the best, whatever. But just, just keep that in mind. Oh, I met the code. Great. You met the lowest bar that you were legally mandated that you that, that you had to meet, right? 
uh, doesn't always mean that that's the most appropriate. You, the engineer and the architect, the design professionals working with the client should be having those conversations when they're doing the program plan for the building about, and as we move towards what we call performance-based design, it's not like, oh, I want a building, the building meets the code, I'm good. No, you have the, 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 we're moving to the point they're farther along in earthquake engineering and, and seismic design. We're getting starting, just starting in that in wind and, and other hazards is, hey, do you realize meeting the code doesn't define a performance level? Uh, you know, some people just think, oh, if I met the code, I should be able to survive any hazard. No, we, we clearly not. We're, you should be able to survive the hazards that are listed in the code at the hazard levels, at the return periods with fairly minimal damage. Um, and so you need to be having those, the discussion. And I'm actually, I'm jumping ahead to the PBD slide. So let me, let me hold on a sec. I got 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 uh, involved there. So one, we have this risk category three or four. Uh, one, are you in the tornado prone region? If you're not, you can stop there. If you are, you keep going. The next what, test is, is your tornado speed V sub T, uh, is that greater than 60 miles per hour? If it's not, it turns out that's never gonna control over our regular wind load design. Uh, and so you can bail out there. The next test is, uh, for different exposure categories, exposures are different, uh, kind of a different surface roughnesses uh, for, for, for the upwind fetch. Exposure B is going to be urban and suburban roughness. Exposure Z, C is kind of flat open terrain. Exposure D is if you're uh, near the water, if the wind's coming over the water. And so we have different ratios here. For you'll, you'll see for tornado, we only have one exposure, which is undefined. We just didn't under, fully understand the effects of surface roughness on, 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 the, uh, on, on the tornado wind speed. And so we have just one undefined exposure with that uh, uniform velocity profile which you showed. But the other hazards do have a regular boundary layer profile and that boundary layer profile changes based on the, uh, based on, on the, the, the exposure category which is based on the upwind roughness. And so we have these different tests. If you're in urban suburban uh, exposure wooded exposure B, if your tornado speed is greater than half of your basic wind speed, uh, then you have to do design. If it's less, then you don't. So anyway, you have several different tests here where you can bail out and you don't have to calculate tornado loads uh, uh, per, per, per the minimum if you don't meet these several tests. If you get to the point where you say, yes, well, wow, wow these were all yeses, design for tornado loads is required, then you're gonna have to go through and calculate tornado loads. It's possible, depending upon the geometry and all of your building and the heights and a lot of other conditions here, it's possible you may end up after you do that, the tornado calcs, that it doesn't, that nothing controls, maybe a little bit controls. This part of the roof controls over wind, but wind dominates everything else. Or if you got a big building in the mid, in, in Tornado Alley, probably Tornado is gonna control a lot of the design, the, the, the wind load design of the building then. Okay. This Tornado PBD, performance-based uh, procedures, that's what I, we have an explicit statement that allows uh, performance space subject to the approval of the authority having jurisdiction, which means the building official. Um, these uh, uh, per design, per tornado based uh, design procedures shall conform uh, to uh, some pr pr requirements that they have in section 1.3.1.3, 1 uh, including uh, peer review requirements. And so even now we've, we've added some similar PBD provisions, explicit provisions in the regular wind load chapter as well. So now let's take a look at the couple of equations and how they're gonna change. Uh, and again, I realize we have a bunch of folks who aren't wind, wind and structural engineers on here. So I'll just take a minute and, try and explain this equation. So we, we do a two-step process to calculate what the pressure is on the, on the surface of the building. The first step is we calculate what we call the wind velocity pressure. And really that's Bernoulli's equation, half rho v squared. That's, a, that's from the commentary. Now it doesn't, in the, in the standard, it doesn't look like half rho v squared. It looks like, this 0.00256 times a bunch of Ks times a V squared. 0.00256 is the half with a lot of units conversions in it because we're a little bit backwards in engineering and we still use English units, uh, 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 imperial units instead of uh, SI. We have Kz is the velocity pressure exposure coefficient. And that accounts for what I was talking about, what the different terrain exposure is and what height above the ground are you. So that accounts for the what boundary layer profile are you in. We have a KZT, which is a topographic factor. If you're on top of a hill, you get some topographic speed up effects. KD is a directionality factor. Uh, this accounts for when you have your maximum wind speed, what's the likelihood that that maximum wind speed matches up with the most vulnerable direction of the building? Uh, that's less than unity, right? Um, and so that's a, a little bit factor that's a little bit less than one. We have KE as an elevation factor, and that accounts for uh, the uh, air density, 
is actually is less if the if you're you know in 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 uh, Denver, uh, and so the same wind speed in Denver uh, causes only about uh, 87 or 88 percent of the pressure uh, on the surface as it does uh, uh, you know on the Gulf Coast just because the, the air density is less. So this elevation factor accounts for the changing air density with with changing ground elevation. So these are this is the ASE 716 equations. I'll note that when we take a look at oops in the ASE 722. This, even the, the regular wind chat equations are going to change. This KD is coming out because the KD is not purely a function of the wind. It also is a function of the type of structure and the building geometry. And so it's not purely a function of the wind. And so the KD is going to get moved into the pressure equation, not in the velocity equation, since it's not purely a function of the climatology. So here on this slide, I've showed you now we have a tornado velocity pressure. So what changed? Instead of calling it Q, we call it Q sub T. Instead of KZ, we call it KZ. We are, since we already have a KZT for topographic with a lowercase t, we said, gosh, that's confusing if we have a KZT with an uppercase t. So for this term, we just called it, we use TOR instead of T um, for, for this one term here. So we weren't quite consistent here, but we just want to make sure we separate that. Out. So this KZ, so it turns out the KZ uh, for tornadoes only varies with height. It does not vary with terrain. Hopefully in the 2028 version, maybe it will vary with terrain. I know. We have some, there's research going on about that. And then we have a tornadic wind speed and how we get that is different from how we get a regular wind speed. So these things are are, are, are the differences. So the, what the, runs, the KE, the elevation factor doesn't change. The air density in, in Denver is still the air density in Denver, whether or not the building gets hit by a tornado or the building got hit by a thunderstorm wind or a frontal winds. Now, there is the issue of uh, does the, Air, air, there, there's, the, there's the air density change because of elevation above ground. There's also an air density change because, hey, hurricanes are low pressure systems. If you're in the core of the hurricane uh, or near in, in that radius to maximum wind, should you be able to take some reduction because the air is, is less than our standard? And this, we use standard atmospheric, this 0.0256 is based on standard atmospheric conditions, uh, uh, by the way, sea, sea level uh, uh, and standard temperature and, 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 and pressure. Uh, the, uh, the fact that a tornado, could we have done that? There's limited work in the literature. Perhaps in the modeling, we might have tried to been able to, to account for that pressure deficit um, in the uh, uh, lower density, uh, sorry, in, in the core of the tornado. We did not. Uh, perhaps that's something to be considered in the 2028 edition of the standard. Certainly, we may want to look at that for, for hurricanes uh, because we may, be, we may have a little bit of an overestimate because we do account for this uh, change in density with elevation, but not with, um, uh, but not with the actual storm type. Uh, and so the velocity pressure, let me just show you this. I talked briefly about how we developed this profile from uh, the radar data. And you can say, gosh, there was scatter all over. And we know, and, and, but a couple of the key things that we know is in many cases, there is something of a bull nose where the wind speed increases closer to the ground when you're at the, uh, at the radius to maximum wind. We saw that in the wind tunnel data from the tornado simulators. We saw that in the numerical simulations. We saw that in, in, in Josh and Karen's uh, 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 radar data for not every single storm, but for a lot of the tornadoes near the ground. Now, I will let you know the uncertainty and the big scatter that was accounted for, for each one of these important parameters, we, ca we calculate, in this case, we said, let's just try and look at a, a, a at kind of an average uh, profile value. But the fact that there was a lot of scatter in there factors into that reliability analysis I showed you. So for each one of these different parameters, uh, we look at the distribution. Uh, so when we look at the K, the, the K factors and all those, you know, are they normally distributed? Are they log normally distributed? Whatever? How are they distributed? What's the shape of that distribution? And then that shape of that distribution factor, and, and as well as uh, factors into that un uncertainty analysis uh, that, that, that comes out in the reliability, that, that comes out in the reliability analysis to let us know if we, if we met those factors. So for design purposes, and, and for our forensic engineering folks, this may not be the case every time, right? But this on average for design, this is the profile that we are assuming. Because like I said, sometimes you're not in the core. Maybe you're farther away and you had some lower speed. In that case, you would have been, uh, maybe you're, 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 you would be something between a boundary layer profile and this profile that's shown here. Well, okay, like I said, that's, that's captured in some of the uncertainty uh, that sometimes it's lower and sometimes it's, it, it's higher than this. And so we can see also on this chart here for our uh, uh, KZ. And by the way, so this is this is not a plot of the uh, velocity profile. This is a, a kind of a, a plot of the um, uh, uh, square root of the velocity profile uh, 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 
for the, the, which is which is because we'll use this this k factor because this k factor is a linear multiplier on uh, is a linear multiplier on 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 uh, on v squared, not on v. Uh, so in terms of the the average velocity, but you see it drops down to like 0.95 here at, at elevation. Uh, in terms of our, it's uniform. We assume a uniform, and so this is the the profile of the horizontal winds uh, in in the tornado as they increase with height. It decreases. It look fairly uniform here. In some of the in some of the data, it was it was dropping off. In some of the models, it was dropping off a little bit. In some of the other stuff, in some of the 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 the, the measurements, it's actually increasing here at the end. We just kind of uh, took the, the took it straight down to the ground here. Um, if this was a velocity profile, this would, we would square this, and so this would drop off to about 0.9 times the the, the, the normalized velocity at, uh, closer to the ground. So now, when we look at our tornado speed, um, those are dependent on the plan size of the building and other structure. And so, if we could just can imagine, if we have a geometric point target, think uh, of a communications tower, self-supporting, not a guide tower, which has the guy wires extending out. Think of a self-supporting just a cantilever tower uh, that's a you know it's got a couple of square foot pro uh, plan area and that's it perhaps that's a point target if that tornado shifts even a little bit that uh, you have an offset tornado that's going to miss that target but if we have some offset tornado as well and we have a building uh, that has some area to it or a structure has some area to it then that's going to hit the tornado so that's going to hit still hit the building so i think we can understand that the the strike probability increases with increasing target size for the building or facility and most people don't have problem with that they do struggle somehow connecting that back to hey if i have a certain return period why does i get a, a larger wind speed a different thing it's basically when you look at, it's just looking at it from a different axis in essence right here you, you people can understand we have a larger strike probability if the building is larger you know hey gosh i just we just had a tornado in um uh, uh uh in the dallas area up up kind of um in in the in the in the county where that where the airport is which i forgot what county name that is anybody can but uh if we say is it more likely that the, that the tornado hit a building or is it more likely to hit the terminal building for dfw uh, of course it's more likely to hit the terminal building right uh and so that works out that the tornado the size effects uh have, have a very significant effects and we'll show you that uh actually we showed you that last time in the meeting the at the for, we showed an example in the middle of the country at the 3000 year return period the risk category 4 the difference between looking at a point target and looking at a lar very large building uh, 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 like a hospital uh, campus or so was going to be 45 miles per hour or so in the uh, in the wind speed at the same at the same return period so what what we need is we need the the plan area of the building well buildings aren't always nice rectangles or squares right buildings have all kind of funny shapes to them and the tornado isn't going to slide across here and, and going to come in and wiggle in and wiggle back out and kind of go in this part. Tornado is going to kind of go in a line, at least over the scale of the building. It's probably going to be moving in a straight line over there. And so what we do, we decided we developed this effective plan area is you take the building footprint and you draw a convex polygon around that. And that is your effective plan area. If you want to simplify it and just make a, pick the smallest rectangle that goes around it, that would be fine as a simplification. You get a slight increase. But again, the 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 wind speeds vary kind of over orders of magnitude with AE. So a small change between the two the two shown here would have very very minimal effect. But that's going to be our definition of effective plan area. You take the plan area of the building, you draw a convex polygon around it, and you take that area. Now, here's one of the special things for essential facilities. This is my hospital. This is the physical plant. This runs the air conditioning. This runs the, has the medical gases. This has all the stuff needed to keep the hospital running. If this building goes down, then the hospital goes down. So in essence, this acts like one much bigger building because if the tornado comes over here, let's say I got a tornado, it's running more south to north here. And this is right near the edge because I got a few hundred feet right here and it wipes out this building, but it doesn't touch the hospital. That's it, hospital's out of business anyway. Even if the hospital, even if this building had no damage at all, the physical plant got damaged. And so this building's out of business. So in essence, this thing acts like a bigger building. So for essential facilities, if you need this building to keep that building running, then you consider this whole thing as one big uh, area for, for your essential area for the, for the facility. So what do some of these maps look like then? At our risk category three, so this is gonna be for schools and uh, assembly centers and things like that, which has a 1700 year return period. Uh, we see we have an 84 peak gust wind speed in, in kind of our center of the country. Uh, extending over to the southeast. 
Um, and then we see the, the and by the way, you can't we can't probably can't read the, the contour numbers or depending upon how big you got this blown up on your screen. They're a little bit small just to be able to get a bunch on the page here. But uh, the lowest contour is 50. So if you remember, if our tornado speed is less than 60 miles per hour, which is our, our, our next contour in, then you don't have to design for tornado. So if I had a, and this is for a 10,000 square foot target area. If we could look at the bottom here, this is for a million square foot. So that's for a really, 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 really big facility. Uh, we can see there's, hey, we've got uh, 20 some odd miles per hour uh, in, increase uh, right here um, in, in, the, in, the, in the tornadic de design wind speed. And here we have similarly for the difference between our risk category two on the left and our risk category three for the same target sizes, um, or something like 15, on averaging something like 15 miles per hour increase. So in the tornado, uh, in the standard, we have eight different map target sizes from one square foot, which was for our point target up to 4 million square foot. Turns out you interpolate, well, you know, what if I have, uh, I got 10,000 in the standard, there was also one for 40,000. What if my building's 20,000? Well, I'll get a value based on where I'm located here. Uh, if I'm in uh, uh, central Oklahoma, whatever, I'll get a value for the 10,000, I'll get a value for the 40,000, and then I'll interpolate between those two values. Um, and then we also have an appendix that has these long return periods. Hey, I want to design for a bigger tornado. Uh, I, I have a requirement. In some cases, Department of Transportation uh, has requirements for liquefied natural gas facilities. They have to use a 10,000 year mean recurrence interval. So we have a longer map for that. So anyway, we have these longer maps that are in an appendix that are not required for use by the standard, but they're available. Now that gives us, that's how we calculate our velocity pressure in the fluid. Now we have to convert that to how's, what's the pressure in the fluid to a pressure on the building surface. We are, our general forms of the equation in, for our regular wind loads is we have P is our design pressure. Uh, we, we have Q, we take our velocity times for the main wind force that I'm looking at right here, times a gust effect factor, times a C sub P is an external pressure coefficient. For our components and cladding, again, that might, that's the skin of the building, uh, those sorts of things. Here we, we take the uh, uh, velocity pressure times this integrated, uh, our engineers know a G C sub P, a gust effect factor times pressure coefficient is already developed. And then we have a, a, an internal pressure factor here. Um, so we have some changes to those for tornadoes. Uh, we see most of those terms have, have are somewhat modified with the exception of the basic pressure coefficients. Those basic pressure coefficients, there's many tables in the standard for many different size, shapes of buildings, for different roof shapes and different roof slopes, uh, different roof geometries and arched roofs and uh, uh, all those sorts of things. And so there's no way that we that we could possibly reproduce all of that. And so that's why I said we have this modifier. We added this KV modifier so that we could take what the existing pressure coefficients were and account for the additional uplift on the roof if you're in, in, in the core of the tornado. So briefly about these several different parameters, um, let me speed it up here a little bit. We're, uh, our gust effect factor, we use the rigid structure provisions from chapter 26. Um, the duration of the tornado is sufficiently short so that we don't feel that the, for the dynamically sensitive or tall buildings or flexible buildings, that those that wouldn't apply. Our directionality factor, uh, that we, we adapted the work that was uh, done for the, the regular wind loads to, to be able to use it with, the, with these new tornadoes. Um, uh, and you, you'll, see, you'll see the results of the table for that. And then we have this new KVT factor, which only applies to the, uh, the pressures on the roofs. And we, we showed you that, um, the development of that before. So our directionality factor, um, and I'll show that in comparison with the regular wind load. It turns out for the main wind force resisting system, it's a little bit less. We did, again, we used the same kind of analysis, uh, but it turns out that, that we get slightly less for the main wind force resisting system. Uh, for, the, um, uh, for the roof, it kind of depends upon where you are in the roof zone. If you're, the, this roof zone one prime is the middle of the roof. We get a little bit higher directionality factor. For other cases, it's a little bit lower. We'll also note that we've said for essential facilities, we're going to make this one. So as, I, as if you recall that I mentioned, this directionality factor accounts for the reduced likelihood that the that the wind is going to line up with the worst the worst the worst wind is going to line up with the worst direction for the building that maximizes the aerodynamic loads on it. Um, but you still have some uh, probability there. And for an essential facility, you can't afford to even lose a few shingles or lose one piece of siding because the water may get in that may affect the functionality of the building. If it's a hospital, you lose infection control, et cetera. And so 
and you typically don't have the, co the components of cladding don't have a lot of redundancy. On this main wind forest resisting system, while theoretically for, for essential facilities, we probably should have also put it as one as well. Uh, and we do for, for, for design of uh, for design of tornado shelters, we do use one. Um, we do uh, we, we take, do take into account that there is re redundancy for the main typically redundancy for the main wind forest resisting system. So we did not increase it, the KD there. Our KVT factor, as I mentioned, this accounts for the, the this additional uplift on the roof for the for the vertical component. For main wind forest, it's basically a 10% increase on average. For components and cladding, it can range from 5% to 30% increase, depending upon what the roof slope is and where you are if you're on the edge or the corner or the middle of the roof. So our, again, our pressure coefficients each just get modified by this non-dimensional uh, uh, KVT parameter. Protection of glazed openings. For essential facilities, basically we're requiring you have to protect your glaze openings. We see so much more, even at the low tornado speeds, tornadoes have much more, because of the uplift, tornadoes have much more intense debris than, than hurricanes and, and other storms. And so again, if you're gonna maintain the, the, the building, we, we require that. So protection of uh, glazed opening is, is required if you have an essential facility. Again, it's gonna be your hospital, police, fire stations, those sorts of things. Protection can either be impact protect, protective glazing or an impact protective system which could either be a non-operable, a fixed, fixed metal screen or something, or you can have a permanently a fixed uh, operable system. Now, different from a hurricane, you don't have a day or two to see the hurricane come in and, uh, and, and, and install this. You have to have a shutter that's permanently affixed. Some places they have something that's actually a shutter on the inside of the window. Hey, the tornado siren goes off, the tornado's coming, we can just close that and latch that and, and do that. But to be able to, that's really gonna be used to kind of in a small buildings in a very rare situation. Testing requirements are basically the same missiles and requirements that we have for the windborne debris region in hurricane prone parts of the country, except for we don't have the cyclic pressure testing requirements that you have for the hurricane, but we're using the same missile, the nine pound uh, two by four, um, typically at the 34 miles per hour that we use for the hurricane. Um, our, our internal pressure coefficient, most of that is the same with the exception of for enclosed buildings, uh, we have, uh, what happens is the more tightly sealed the building is, you have less internal pressure. And for those of you who aren't engineers, if you figure out, think about if we have uh, the garage door gets blown in and all of a sudden that wind rushes into the building or the bay window in the front of the house, the, the air rush, wind rushes in, uh, you get a pulse when that thing fails and that pushes up on the roof. You also have a steady state once it's open, the air is rushing in, it's pushing up, you get internal pressure pushing up on the roof. On the top of the roof, you have suction as the wind flows over, like you have on the top of the wing, and those two things contribute to, an all, to a lot of failures. Well, even if you don't have an opening, and every building has some leakage and some small openings for makeup air, and even if you don't have any damage, the more tightly sealed your building is, particularly now with, with green building codes and energy efficiency, then that becomes worse for the atmospheric pressure change when the tornado, if you get hit by the core and the tornado pressure drops, then you do actually start to have, and that is gonna to start to input loads on, on the building. And so here's the change here for enclosed buildings. We see that if your building is enclosed, you're gonna get a 0.55 uh, positive internal pressure coefficient that accounts for uh, the, the, the atmospheric pressure change component uh, and the rest doesn't change. We also added for sealed other structures. So this is gonna be like a tank or a vessel, not a building, but a tank or a vessel or something. If that's completely sealed, uh, but it still has some, some uh, air, not, if it's not completely full, right, if it's still only partly full, then you can get a significant uh, um, load that, that would be induced by the, uh, the, the pressure drop. Um, we also have a wind tunnel procedure. And basically, if you're using the wind tunnel, you can use the wind tunnel to calculate the pressure and force coefficients. And you would do that in an isolated building model in a boundary layer wind tunnel with open exposure. And that's gonna give you something. So you maybe have a really odd shape. Most of the buildings in our, in our uh, most of the shapes in our building code are just rectangular prisms. Okay, a few of them have a curved roof shape or a mansard or something, but basically they're just, the plan shape is just some rectangle. Obviously you get some uh, architects go crazy and you get some really, really complicated shapes, a building that looks like a guitar for the hard rock cafe, whatever, something. Hey, we don't have a shape that looks like that. You wanna do a wind tunnel test to figure out just what the pressure coefficients are, you can do that. But typically on a wind tunnel test, you also normally would do a site specific wind study uh, and incorporate directionality. We don't allow that because the tornadoes are so much different than the regular winds. Uh, and so you can only use a wind tunnel study to get the, the, the pressure and force coefficients similar to the coefficients as, as, um, um, as applied right now uh, that, that we adapted from the current standard. So uh, got uh, 
um, a little bit more to go here, but then we're kind of through with this this part uh, right here. What, what what's the status? What's happening with all this stuff I just showed you? It turns out that uh, all the tornado ballots have passed ASCE 7 main committee, and they have now been approved for inclusion in the public comment draft of ASCE 722. Um, ASCE anticipates publishing that in mid June uh, of this year through July, uh, as uh, this is, will be uh, again a public comment on their website. Anybody can download it and read it, review it. And anybody is well welcome to submit comments. All comments must be considered and responded to by the main committee. Our wind speed estimation standard, we're still another year or, or more away from that standpoint, but it's a pretty pretty exciting when it gets to that point where, hey, we get it, we get, get it, we can put that out and, and uh, get, get, get a lot of public feedback on that. So now let's just talk uh, a, a little bit about what does this really mean? What are the implications of this? So some colleague, a colleague on our uh, uh, ASE 7 standard, Ben Harris, um, and one of his colleagues, Blake Haney, with a firm called Huckabee, they're an architecture engineering firm in the Dallas area that primarily specializes in the education market. And uh, they uh, did a case study looking at the uh, DFW area, what is, how is this going to affect their clients, the school districts, uh, uh, some higher ed clients that they do, uh, what, what are the loads going to change, what's the cost impact. So they were doing, he told me that they were working on this, they were looking at an elementary school and a high school, and they said, hey, while you're doing this, could you also look at a fire station and a hospital? Uh, campus, so we can get some risk category four. They gratefully, gratefully agreed to do that. And so we have, we we developed. They kind of looked at some sort of prototype or archetype sort of buildings. They designed a lot of schools. They took sort of created an average school. Hey, a two-story school, and what was the average square footage for for the size of the buildings? Uh, those sorts of things. They looked at exposures B and C. Um, for schools, they did they did not put in impact. Uh, I call those buildings for calculation of the internal pressure. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on this. So this one, this slide just summarizes the different parameters for these different um, um, thing, uh, uh, different uh, schools and examples. And it's a busy slide, and there's I got a few of them. I'm just going to kind of show you the uh, generally what's happening here is the four different types of buildings we looked at are the four different colors here. Green is elementary school, brown is high school. Red is fire station, blue is hospital. The solid bars are the ASE 7 wind loads from the regular wind load provisions. The hashed bars are from tornado loads. Do we see a trend here? Hey, the hashed bars are higher, right? Sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot. So the first thing is, wow, from tornado loads in Dallas look like for these four prototype or archetype buildings, looks like they're going to, tornado loads, it looks like they're going to increase a lot. So it turns out that the pressures, and some of this is being driven by this, buildings are typically fully enclosed and designed as fully enclosed. The fact that we have this APC, atmospheric pressure change contribution, where we're designing this building to have to have the positive internal pressure of 0.55 coefficient instead of 0.18 is driving up some of these coefficients, the pressures on the net pressures on the surface. When we look at the net lateral force, so basically the base shear on the building, so we, you know, if you, some the pressure on the windward force and the, the windward face of the building and the leeward face, the internal pressures cancel out, right? So now we're just looking at the difference in the net force. And we see here, actually, eh, there isn't that much difference for this particular examples in the, uh, uh, in the net lateral force on the building. But the la say the uplift on the roof, hey, we do have some significant uplift and that's an issue. It turns out that it's likely negligible impact on structure cost and we'll see that uh, later on. If we look, that was for exposure B, by the way, where we see some pretty big increases. Did the exact same analysis, and this is for the main wind force resisting system. So this is you know, your, 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 your main structural frame. For exposure C, we see pretty much the same trend, but the hash bars don't stick up nearly as much above they do in exposure B. And if you remember back when we look at, that's because our exposure C profile, the, wind, the, the basic wind speed we're already designing for and the wind pressures in exposure C is already like 30% or so greater than uh, even at the lower speeds than we're, than we're doing it for exposure B. So the differences aren't as big. Similarly, if we look at our roof pressures now with, with exposure B, again, we see this kind of same relative trend. The tornado is higher, for a fair bit higher for exposure B, but when we go to exposure C, it's not as much higher or sometimes actually even, even a little bit lower. And so the cost impacts, as it turns out for this, are really not that bad. Now, this is partial cost study. The cost study that they did only considered the primary structural steel, the foundation costs, uh, the, the wall studs and decking and stuff. It doesn't consider 
that you need might need different roof covering, different roof assembly, different roof shingles or different roof covering. It might need different rooftop equipment. It didn't encourage glazing or the windows. Uh, uh, so anyway, it's a partial. But anyway, for a, a exposure B and C for a ice elementary school and a high school, if we just jump down to the bottom line here, if we're looking at the cost of the project here, we're talking about at the moment a fraction of one percent. Now again, we're we're actually working with our applied economics office and 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 the, these guys from Huckabee to do some additional work to look at not only what are these additional costs that they didn't uh, assume, do in in their in their uh, initial observation, but then also to look at generalizing this for more than just the DFW area. But let me just give you the last couple of slides to show what does this really mean in terms of comparing our VT, which is our tornado speed, with our basic wind speed. So the red dots here, and I can't just show you two maps side by side. Or, or, well, I guess I could have put a 100,000 100, square foot area map here. Uh, that would have been better. I could have put it up here. But for a bunch of different cities, these red dots, I've pulled the map for, for assuming this for the elementary school. So for risk category three, for 100,000 square foot target size, I've put these red dots on there. The base map underneath there is the ASE 17, 16 risk category three map, which is the, <clears throat> pardon me, which is the 700 year, um, uh, 1700 year map. And so you can see, for, so this they did the case study in the Dallas Fort Worth region where the tornado speed is 90, but the basic wind speed is 112. And you say, well, gosh, well, why didn't, why didn't tornado, why did tornado control anything? Remember all these other coefficients, a bunch of these other coefficients were higher. Now V has the most impact because V is squared and all these other ones are just linear factors. But still, when you add up some of these other ones and add 10 or 15% here and there and there and there, then that all added up. And so we can see. But if you look at, as it turns out in our in our basic wind speed map, all, we have these high wind speeds on the coast. Obviously, those are hurricane contours, right? Then we have some higher wind speeds up here on the plains. The wind speeds drop off, particularly where we don't have the strong thunderstorms west of the Rockies as much. Uh, but we have something of a trough. And again, I'm just looking at the underlying map. We have something of a trough in here between the area where we have the high hurricane speeds and we have this uh, wind speeds way out on the plains here, the, wind the regular design wind speeds are a little bit less kind of along here. And so it turns out Dallas is close to a worst case. Kind of we have this region kind of North Texas, North Louisiana, Southern Arkansas, over into uh, uh, Mississippi, et cetera. This sort of region right here has the worst relative ratio of a low wind speed and a pretty high tornado speed. And so it turns out that where they did this case study, it's close to sort of a worst case in term, and when I say worst case in terms of the, the most significant changes and the most significant impacts of tornado compared to the impacts of the regular wind speed. And so now that's so this first slide is just what, what are the tornado speeds? Now, if you remember, we had a few different rules. If our tornado speed is less than 60, well, I flagged those I've, and I've showed those in green. So all those dots that are in green, those are less than 60. Okay, I'm not going to have to do tornado, even though they're in the tornado prone region. The wind speed is less than 60. I don't have to design those. If the wind speed has this blue highlight, those are ones where the tornado speed was less than half of the basic wind speed. Uh, and so I'm not going to have to do it there either. I've got 60 miles per hour. So I've met, I didn't meet this first threshold, but I'm between the 100 and uh, I'm above the 120 contour. So I'm above so I'm about 125 or something. So I've got a, a half of my uh, basic wind speed is still 62 or whatever. So I don't have to do that. But any number that still has a red, any of these dots that still has a red number next to it, I am going to have to at least check the tornado loads. Now, another thing which I can do to get to get an idea of how can I use the, the, the Dallas study to be able to infer what's going on in these other locations is I can uh, look at look at this from the observation that pressure pressures on the on the surface are proportional to the to the square of the wind speed. I can basically just ratio the ratio of the tornado pressure at some particular location. Uh, based on the, compared to the wind pressure, and I can compare that to the pressure of, uh, from the DFW uh, from the tornado wind speed to the pressure in DFW from the basic wind speed, and then I can substitute in here uh, the pressure pressure ratio for the wind speed ratio, which I do have. I have a tornado speed and a, uh, a, a basic wind speed here, and so what this does is gives me a parameter which normalizes. So Dallas is 100, so that's that's 100 means there's no change from Dallas. Okay. So it turns out DFW is worse to the location. All cities that have a parameter less than 100, the relative increases are smaller than I showed you on all those bar charts. And so, yeah, tornadoes are going to increase the load some, but not as much as I just showed you. So all these other places, they're going to have less. Again, here, over in this area right here, there's a location they're going to increase. This number is more than 100. 
the, the, the differences are gonna be a little bit higher right here. So this area kind of from the North Texas over into the upper Southeast, those areas are gonna have the most changes in terms of our in terms of our practice. So anyway, wrapping up here, what's the, what's the final takeaways? Tornado loads must be considered in a risk category three and phone struct three and four structures in our tornado prone region. Our tornado loads aren't required if the wind speeds are less than 60 or if our tornado tornado speeds are less than ratios, depending these ratios, depending upon our, our, our exposure conditions. The tornado loads are more likely to control at least some elements of the wind load design compared to the, our, 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 our regular wind loads. For buildings or structures, one, that are located in either Tornado Alley in the Midwest or the Southeast, but I'll put the caveat, the, not the Southeast when you're close to the coast. The high, the, the high hurricane speeds will dominate over the tornado there. Uh, for buildings or structures that have large effective plan areas, the larger the building is, the, uh, the, the, the effective plan area, the more likely it is to have a larger speed. And for buildings that have essential facilities, again, we saw some special provisions that have increased load requirements for or increased the parameters for essential facilities. So with that, I'll just wrap up here, let you know that there's some publications in the pipeline. Uh, here's the cover uh, sheet that's been in review. It's in uh, NIST internal review. It's about 700 pages long, so it's taken a while. Uh, we anticipate having that out in the next few months to, to go over the maps. I, I should mention that one yesterday. We also have a, a, a draft report that we had shared with the committee on development of these new, all these different new K factors uh, that are used in there. We also are working on a draft report on this probabilistic uh, uh, tornado load criteria and, and the reliability analysis that was un, un, underlies uh, that. So all of these will be published uh, at some point late, later on in this year. With that, I'll go ahead and uh, stop and ask for questions. Thank you very much, Mark. And I got a, a series of questions from uh, Scott uh, Walkowitz. And Scott, I think I'll go ahead and unmute you on my side and let you ask them yourself. You'll have to unmute yourself on your side. And if you can, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, I'll paraphrase your questions. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. And I did ask several questions. I don't necessarily need to take everybody's time with these questions, but I'm happy to ask them if we're willing to stay online. Um, some of the questions I have are related to things that I don't understand. And uh, just being exposed to this and working with the ICC 500, um, I wanted to ask a little bit more. Um, and one of the, I guess if I work backwards, the first question maybe is that early comments that I had heard was that these changes would essentially bring tornado design wind speeds of some sort into play for pretty much every building. And that's clear through this discussion that that would not be the case for occupancy risk category one and two buildings. And, you know, without getting into everything, you know, I don't know how the 700 year mean recurrence interval was set for an occupancy two category building, but I'm just thinking through this and there's a lot of uh, occupancy category two buildings that are built, some of which are very, very large buildings. You know, I've done some myself in the half a million square foot uh, range, and it seems like there is an opportunity for there to be increased risks, even for those uh, type of building occupancy. So I was wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit more about that, you know, how that 700 year was deemed to fit and, you know, what what is the concern maybe for some of these uh, occupancy two uh, buildings. Right. So, so the the reliability target itself is in Chapter One of ASC 716 uh, that was published in the 2016 edition. The commentary, uh, the commentary for for Chapter One provides some some explanation on the historical background uh, for development of that 700 years. Now, we didn't we didn't start out and say, hey, we're going to try and match 700 years. We said we're going to try and match the reliability target, which is given in the standard. As it turns <laughs> out. And partly because there was some conservatism, and particularly that we, there was some conservatism in the selection of the nominal parameter for, particularly for this internal pressure coefficient, it turns out that the reliability worked worked out, the return periods worked out to come out pretty darn close to the same return periods that we have, which did work out nicely. Just it's, it makes it a little bit easier for uh, purposes of just communication. Uh, you know, if it would have worked out to be 10,000 years, some people are gonna say, oh my gosh, 10,000 year return period, that's crazy. Why are we doing that? Whatever. Well, it just worked out that the, those are the accepted return periods that are used. And I, I won't take more time because that's, that, that's not an issue. The, the reliability, we met the, basically we came close to meeting the target reliabilities. The target reliabilities are set by ASCE 7 
Um, and so you can, I'll point you to the, the, the chapter one commentary and we will be writing a, a report coming out, although that's not really gonna delve too much into that issue. There is a bigger picture question and this may be something that the committee that, that we discussed early on in the standard is, are those same reliabilities, do we want to have different reliabilities for a tornado? Uh, and there's kind of a yes and a no, because you say, hey, for hurricanes, we see those things coming two days out or whatever. We have an opportunity to, to take some kind of life safety protection measures other than just being in the building. Maybe we evacuate, maybe we'll put up shutters, maybe we do something. But we don't have that for thunderstorms, right? Maybe we get a warning. Maybe we got the NOAA app on our phone. Maybe we get a few minute warning on a thunderstorm, but we might not have any warning on a thunderstorm uh, as well. So we, it, it, you know, that, that, that's similar to tornado. So we decided and that not even knowing, you know, where this was going until late in the process, because we couldn't do the reliability analysis until we had all the maps done and all the tornado load provisions. So we basically had to have everything done. Then we could use all those to develop the, the, the reliability work, which we didn't do till last spring to do the reliability or doing complete to last spring when all the other parts were all completed, kind of building the, the, the plane while you're flying it. And then we come out and said, oh, okay, these things worked out to be the same. As a conversation for, for the, the next edition of the standard maybe, because I certainly do hear you, there's some buildings where we may wanna, even at risk category two, we may wanna have to consider that. Maybe we need to think about different risk, uh, risk category targets uh, for, for, for tornado as a possibility. The other thing, like I started out beginning, uh, the building code and the standard are minimum. Doesn't mean that that's necessarily the best practice. Doesn't mean that that's necessarily uh, uh, the right thing to do. It's the minimum that you're legally allowed to do. And there's other, there's always always other cases where you may have to do more than that, or it may be appropriate to do more. Okay. Now, Scott, uh, maybe we can return to your other questions afterwards. Uh, I just want to get in a couple others here from some other people, if that's okay. Sure. And uh, one of those will be uh, John DeBlock. Uh, John, hang on a second. I'll go ahead and unmute you. Can you hear me, Jim? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so um, you just mentioned the protection of life. Um, the majority of the fatalities, of course, occur in residential structures, um, yet this work doesn't seem to do anything to enhance um, any potential adapt adaptation as building code down the road is that I, I mean obviously the cost from from a tornado standpoint you look at the dollars that are lost the infrastructure expenses the large buildings of course that's I, I think you're covering that with this work but when you talk about the loss of life it doesn't seem like we're really touching on that with with a, this work that's being done is that kind of an accurate assessment or what any comments yes. towards that yes no I, very accurate good points so that's two things that's one why we made sure we had that on the very first page of the chapter we got this huge box that says this doesn't this isn't primarily for life safety protection now even if you have a building and even if you have a building that's risk category three or four you saw some of those design speeds at the risk category three and four return periods are 90 miles per hour 100 110 120 Gosh, how's that going to protect me from an EF4 or 5? It doesn't. Now, even if you're, if you're, you saw that even at those lower tornado speeds, the loads are somewhat increased. You're going to be in a more robust building. That's going to provide some level of protection. But for life safety protection, we still want you to be designing a storm shelter or a, or, or FEMA, or, or a FEMA safe room or going above and beyond what's in there, what, what the absolute, what the absolute minimum are. That's even for the buildings that are covered by the standard. Again, we've, we're working within this current standard. In the building code arena, uh, you're right, this doesn't include uh, the, the, the residential construction. Now that we have this completed, part of our overall project plan for implementation of the rest of these recommendations is, we will now go back, now that we have a tornado load methodology, we understand the tornado hazards, uh, similar to what, what's been done in, for example, in Moore, where they adopted the residential tornado building code, where they, they put some additional requirements and you have, you've got to have straps and things, uh, we're going to go back and do cost benefit analyses uh, based on tornado damage modeling, et cetera, to be able to see which of those things make sense and what can we do at a relatively low cost to be able to improve, propose improvements, develop guidance, uh, at least as a minimum, develop a, a design guidance to improve residential construction. And then to a step beyond that is maybe propose some of those things, particularly if we can get some cost effect, very cost effective measures, propose those for inclusion in the IRC, International Residential Code, but that's future work. But now that we finally got, this was our first step. We're, we're not done. 
Uh, we've got, you know, several years from now, we're going to take this work and we're going to work, then start to work in, in some of these other areas as well. Good. Great, Thank great, you. Question. Great, great question, though. All right. Thank you, John. And uh, uh, that was illuminating to me, too. Um, looks like uh, we can return back to Scott. So, Scott, if you're uh, willing to go ahead and and ask uh, a couple more questions, uh, maybe do another question, and then we can do an afterwards or something like that. Uh, yeah. Just give people a chance to say, hey, they, you know, you can yeah. go if you need to. Okay. Yeah, I'll just pick one. Thank you very much. Um, this is maybe more on my education side, but you had a short discussion on the influence of low pressure in the center, in this case of tornadoes, or he also mentioned hurricanes. And I'm familiar, you know, with hurricane reporting and, you know, they track the atmospheric pressure to rate the storms. And I'm assuming there's some variance once you get outside the eye of a hurricane that the pressure starts to go back to normal fairly quickly. It seems like a tornado in such a small footprint, even for a large tornado, is there much of an influence that could happen there? And what might that influence be once you get out into the actual tornado wind speed field? That Yeah, th that's a good question. We did a very preliminary look when we scoped out the project and we were looking at which variables. I mean, there's a lot of other variables that we could have looked at. Uh, we could have gone more in depth with, with the time constraint of we started this work in 2014 when we published the, the, the Joplin report and we were targeting. We had to have it finished to get it in ASC 722. Uh, so within the time and budget that we had available, uh, we w which things can, can we prioritize and look at? That's one of the areas that we looked at. For tornadoes, there wasn't a whole lot in the literature. There, there, you know, even in, even since 2014, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot more in the tornado and the numerical being done in tornado, numerical modeling. In the last few years, we've had a couple more of these tornado simulators have come on board. Uh, if we started to get to right now today, we would have a lot more information available that we could do from. We we could have potentially modeled it uh, as well and and use that as part of our modeling, but we didn't. We didn't want it to. Again, that wasn't wasn't the main focus, it would have been harder to, to validate against even other things, so we didn't do that. It's still a good up question, maybe for the 2028 edition, we may look at that. I will tell you that we're looking in the context of, we're also doing, I mentioned we're doing this national, we did this national construction safety team investigation for the for the Joplin tornado. Um, uh, we, are, are, we are in year three of our, or, or, or in our fourth year now actually, of a major investigation for Hurricane Maria's effects in Puerto Rico which is actually a far larger study, an order of magnitude larger study of what we did for Joplin. We are looking at building performance. We're looking at the hazards. We're looking at emergency communications. We're looking at loss of life. We're looking at recovery of the businesses. We're looking at recovery of uh, schools and social functions and hospitals, uh, communications, infrastructure. Uh, we've got a much bigger team, et cetera. As part of that and part of the wind modeling that we're doing on that, we are looking for hurricanes at this issue in terms of just how accurate a number we get. But the fact that we the fact that we don't include that, one, we're conservative because we're just using standard temperature and pressure, uh, but we may be using uh, the, the density, air, air density may be less, or certainly is less uh, in the hurricane. And how much does that, you know, right at the core is not where the high winds are. The core high winds are, you know, at, at the radius of maximum winds at the edge of the eye, how much of that is decreasing? Who knows, maybe for, maybe for ASC 7 2028, we may have some parameter uh, in there that, that that accounts for that. So, good, 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 good topic for future research. Yeah, thank you. Actually, okay. you know, I usually, well, one thing I'll just do here, Jim, is I, I, I forgot sure. to put. I usually put my uh, email address on here. If pe folks want to contact me after the meeting, they're more than welcome to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it probably would pro uh, be a good idea to stop now since we're coming up on the hour and a half. And um, Scott, I would assume that you could probably email Mark for any further questions that you might have. Happy to do that. I appreciate the time and it was a great presentation. Thank you. Sure. All right, thank All right. you. Yep. And we'll go ahead and, and uh, adjourn at this point here uh, since I don't have any other questions from anybody else. And, uh, we're running out of time. So, uh, Mark, I definitely want to thank you very much for your presentation. I'm going to make a recording of this and post it on uh, YouTube, and I'll share it with everybody that registered for this uh, show and, and, of course, a couple other email groups as well. And you can certainly share once you get this with anybody that uh, that may want to see this. Um, I know, Mark, you're, you're going to be 
sort of on the talk show circuit, uh, on the presentation circuit, and uh, you may be able to catch him in other venues as well um, as this gets adopted. Right. Otherwise, right, thanks, everybody. and thank you very much, and uh, you all have a nice day.